Dear friends, best regards from Vienna in Austria. My name is Otto Neubauer. I'm married to Carola and we have six children. I run an academy for dialogue and evangelization from the Manuel community in the center of this wonderful city. Excuse me, English is not my mother tongue, so I hope for your understanding for my poor pronunciation. But it's a real joy for me to exchange with you about a special topic that is very close to my heart. Exactly in this special time, I would like to call it like this. As if the whole world had to stand still. Or in other words, on believing in the one God who still cares for this world. During the last days of March, I had to, to wind down a couple of times. One time it was particularly extreme. As this crazy virus started to find its way in the world's headlines, I received a terrible message from a friend. He had lost his only son, 20 years old. Not to COVID-19, it was an accident and a real complicated story behind. After a certain period of shock, I was brave enough to call my friend. Despite the strict lockdown measures, he asked me to go for a walk with him, of course, keeping the necessary distance. But it seemed like the world stood still as we walked next to each other in the streets of an eerily quiet city. Deeply moved, I listened to him as he was trying to put his unbelievable grief into words. On a side note, my friend said that it seemed to him that due to the pandemic, the whole world was winding down together with him. I admit his words, his silence, all the unspeakable, the common walk are all still very present in my heart, weeks later. He told me already years ago that he couldn't believe in God. But in the face of this situation, all these discussions we had had on worldviews and thought patterns seemed so far away, so unreal. While walking together, I could only do one thing. I asked quietly for God's spirit, for right words, and especially for the right way to listen. And at the end of our walk, I felt a very strong and very comforting presence that transcended all that could be humanly understood and grasped. As I looked into my friend's face, into his eyes, I suddenly felt a sort of inner conviction. Yes, he is really here, the Lord himself. I tried to tell my friend that I completely trusted that his son was safe now. I will never forget his gaze at that moment, the repeating pausing and finally the slow response. I know that you believe that. Thank you. As if the heart would like to say more than words ever could. I have shared this story because it was also a very special pilgrim path. Walking with my friend has taught me during these weeks to think especially of those whose gazes I have not seen. But the Lord has seen. The Lord has seen the gazes of the wounded. And I would like to invite you to follow these, these gazes together with me. I would like to invite you to think of those who have lost something these days that they will never get back in this life. Family members, friends perhaps, maybe a job, an economic foundation. And not only in the context of Corona, 
Let's take these wounded with us on our pilgrim's path so that this path may lead us into a newer, much deeper community with this world. As if the Lord was saying to us in the middle of this crisis, wind down and look around. And if you are ready, walk a part of the way with someone because I am present in them. And if I can understand that the Lord walks with the wounded and is present in them, then I also understand that it is my job to be present too. And that then I do not feel obligated to explain right away what is happening in the world. I can renounce the urge to know too fast what the best and only solution is for somebody's life. In times of crisis, the wise friends of Job are way too many, and the fast-booming spiritual formats in the digital world do not have to be the go-to tool for all problems either. I think you cannot digitally, digitally create holiness, but you can be present. And it's the presence of Him, the presence of Him. While reflecting on all that, suddenly the words of the often quoted book Introduction to Christianity by the later Pope Benedict came to my mind again. He said, Jesus has established a perfect community of faith with the lost. Jesus' pilgrim's path is entering in the drama of human existence. And this is the true, he said, he, this is the true holiness of God, which is love, a love that doesn't shy away from the dirt of the world, but mixes with the dirt in order to overcome it. Josef Ratzinger posed an essential question back then that I would also like to ask today as we are on our Pentecostal pilgrimage path as a church. He said, can the holiness of the church be something other than carrying each other? Because we are all carried by Jesus Christ. Yes, Jesus Christ carries us all. Pope Francis recently said, are we able to weep with Jesus as he Weep, is weeping now. Jesus weeps with such a tenderness because he loves, because his heartbeat knows our heartbeat, especially the heartbeat of the wounded. Jesus was deeply moved when he wept for his dead friend Lazarus, although he would later resurrect him and there would be abundant joy but resurrection and miracles always, always take place through a pierced heart. One could even say that the, that the wounds are the substance of resurrection. And even the glorious and reason Jesus first encountered the weeping and infinitely sad Mary Magdalene. He took a long time to walk alongside the helpless, perplexed disciples on their way to Emmaus. He waited for doubting Thomas and showed him his wounds. He looked for the frightening disciples and visited them several times. So, how can we walk from the mercy of Easter towards Pentecost? In the readings during the last weeks, we have heard several times the words from Zechariah 12.10, I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of mercy and supplication, so that when they look on him, whom they pierced, and it said in John that blood and water flowed out 
of his side, its spirit and life. Pentecost stems from exactly this devotion, his devotion to the world. What counts at the, at the end as if we want to receive his heart, if we want to join our hearts with his, in just his heartbeat, harmonize our heartbeat with his. Pentecost, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, is not a magical spiritual event that we can continuously restage or control, or something that we only have to throw into the market strong and often enough. The Holy Spirit is the love of God poured out into our hearts. Supernatural gift and deepest human devotion at the same time. Yes, we have to wind down because our spiritual and liturgical formats must not be nobly detached from the care for the wounded of our time. It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick, says Jesus. In reaction, to being criticized for his many inappropriate friends. Do we really care for this world? Are the outsiders really present in our prayers? Do we really strive to stand up for the world? And how could this even work? Firstly, we could take a lot of time to get to know the heartbeat of Jesus, to listen to him and to adore him, and to ask for his spirit. And we can intercede for concrete people. Our pilgrim's path needs many more places of this kind of adoration and prayers of intercession for the world. And I notice it anew just now how important the community meetings of prayer are that we as brothers and sisters gather our words together and then pray for them. Secondly, we should remember how close the disciples suddenly felt with the people during the, the events of Pentecost in Jerusalem and how surprised they were that this was possible. People came from all over and although there was a lot of chaos, confusion, skepticism, there was also a sort of a divine consolidation that took place, a new proximity, a new community overcoming all human barriers. It was St. Paul who would later also feel gifted with this spirit and he realized that he had to live out this newfound proximity with God. In this spirit, he learned to become all things to all, a Jew for the Jewish, an outlaw for the outlaws, a meek for the meek. This amazing transformation from a fearful distance to a miraculous and healing proximity happened to the disciples, to us, to all of us who followed them up to this day. The mission we have as Christians is to gather the whole human family, family as God's family, so that all, without any exception, may find their way home into their father's house. The mission is not at all about an effective elite, as exotic and zealous this elite may be. The inspiration of the Holy Spirit always leads to a gathering that creates an even bigger community. It is the Lord himself who mystically directs us towards eternity in a caravan of solidarity, which turns into a sacred pilgrimage. 
It is the great gathering of all people. But it happens very concretely in our everyday life. Of living together, of mingling and encounter, of embracing and supporting one another. This is how Pope Francis puts it in his papal document, Evangelii Gaudium. So that we may, he said, step into this flood diet which, while chaotic, can become a genuine experience of fraternity. Evangelii Gaudium 87. It's really our responsibility to, to accompany as many as we can on this pilgrim path, on this caravan. It is our responsibility to walk with the people that live in our immediate neighborhood. Christians are the first to build alliance. And wholeheartedly, according to Pope Francis, what we need most of all is a radical conversion regarding to the first friends of Jesus. Who are the first friends of Jesus? The poor, the sick and the sinners. There is still a tendency, he says, and risk of thinking too high of ourselves and of wanting to stay amongst ourselves in small inner circles, sometimes looking down on the others. But we cannot evangelize from the balcony, the Pope says, not from above and from a far distance. Like the close friends of Jesus, we should be called friends of tax collectors and sinners. Yeah, that's the consequence. Each real encounter, each authentic accompaniment, if taken seriously, will also show us our misery, our fragility, fragility our sins. The story of, of my friend I have shared at, at the beginning, the pandemic of our days but also the fate of every single individual shows us that we are all in the same boat or in the same sea. We are very closely linked to the human family, but be it the barber next door who struggles with alcoholism, a politician who looks for support to establish a more just government, my own children or the children in refugee camps or in slums. Therefore, we need a new heart. A heart that we not only ask for that Pentecost, but that we may ask for and receive at all times. Yes, that's a true miracle, but it's a miracle that needs our authentic desire so that our heart of stone may actually be turned into a heart of flesh. We cannot do this at our own, yes. Let us not forget, but let us not forget, it's out of a pierced heart that overflowing love pours itself out. We are deemed worthy to receive his heart so that we may accompany others and have them join the way. Our neighbors, friends, but also the whole human family. The first gift we received from the risen Jesus was forgiveness. If we pass on this forgiveness as worshippers, intercessors and companions, the fragrance of heaven will be spread from our pilgrimage into the world. It is the fragrance of a big feast, as Pope Francis defines mission. The Lord has called the sinners, not the just. And he has given a promise to all those who accept this merciful love. He will gird himself, have them recline at table and proceed to wait on them. And he will wait for the son of my friend and for my friend himself. And the joy will be incredible in the heaven, but already now. 
Thank you for listening. God bless you.